I am very passionate about adolescents in many ways. As you heard, I continue to deliver clinical care in Washington, D.C. to approximately a clinic of 320 patients, and 65% of my patients are adolescents. I'm a mother of a 19 years old boy, so I've just gone through that wave myself. And uh, um, I also work for Elizabeth Glazier Pediatric AIDS Foundation in the region, working on several adolescence projects. I have no conflicts to disclose. So what I will cover today, try to do it in the 30 minutes, um, uh, is uh, to talk about the stages of adolescent growth and development. I'm really focusing on the physical part of being young. Sexual maturation in males and females. I will look at the differences, what happens with body systems, um, physical health related issues, and approach to health care just to finish up with some very journal principles. So adolescence is a very large span of time, and I really liked when Helen uh, introduced today when she challenged you to think about different stages. There are two pictures of two young men here, and look how different they look. By World Health Organization, adolescence covers 10 to 19 years of age. This is really your second decade indeed. Uh, there is also a different definition uh, of use that's being used by several international organizations, 15 to 24 years of age, but World Health Organization defines young people as 10 to 24 years of age. And by the rights, uh, global rights of the children, the majority of adolescents are children. They are fallen in the category legally under age of 18 as children. And this is just a period of major changes, and I listed just some. You could continue this list in many directions. We will focus on physical and physiological changes, but there are a bunch of others, and in this sense, we're very different from animals, because for us, going through adolescence and puberty is not just biologically changing to become a reproductive unit biologically, but we're also very entangled with the social, economical, and other challenge, some, some things that we believe animals don't face, though sometimes I wonder if we know everything about animals to make that judgment. Um, uh, when I prepared this talk, I looked at some common definitions of adolescence, and it's very interesting, that's what I came across, uh, common descriptions, what people use in the introductory uh, talks, etc. Generally, it's defined as a time of physical growth and personality development. And there are two statements in the second two bullets that are a bit contradictory. On the one hand, it's a series of predictable events, but on the other hand, it's very confusing and ambiguous period for all. And for all meaning, for for those who go through that, but also for those who surround it. But overall, the word that comes across the most as you, as you look through literature and you try to concise it is a time of change. So adolescence has been divided by different entities into three stages, and those ages are very approximate. Please don't hold to the age. Overall, pediatric and developmental world shouldn't hold to the age. It really depends where, in which uh, uh, region of the world we're looking, which race ethnicity we're looking, which cultural contest we're looking. So please look at the age with a, with a, with a freedom, given it some uh, uh, wiggle of space, and indeed by different definitions, you will encounter one or two years difference in those. So early adolescence is defined as 10 to 13, by some 10 to 15, uh, and it's really when we go through puberty as humans. Uh, the most important elements, and it's just the framework that I listed here, are the privacy and independence start being very important at this age, which they were not usually in an early age. Peers become confident and by far more important than parents. And this, we start developing adult role models at this age, really identifying with whom we want to associate. The middle adolescence is here, 14 to 16, in some literature you can find 15 to 17, is really when peer network becomes significantly important, not only getting them as a confident, but building your network. There is a major development cognitively in this, this period of time. This is a time when we are driving to start having a control of our life. This is bundles of energy period defined, though haven't seen how many hours my teenage son could sleep at this age, I really doubt it. I never knew you could sleep that long. 
long. And then developing truly adult identity. Uh, one of my teachers, you can hear by my accent, I'm Russian, I had the privilege to have one of the mentors in philosophy in Russian literature, and she said to me one day, in a literally way, she said, it's a beautiful age when you go away from your roots and your family to come back as an immature person. And this is truly the age when you do that. And then the late adolescence, again, defined by some entities as 18 and older, some limiting at 19, some saying, no, it goes all the way 24. When I look at my husband, I think he's still in late adolescence. <laughs> But uh, it's when we go through separation, when we go through decision making, and that's, we still continue to develop adult identity. And myself, I question sometimes when I do. So today we are going, I'm going to cover only the physical, physiological part, where a lot of speakers will be really talking about some very other important parts of development during adolescence. But it's really formation of the new physical body. And there are two major stages of puberty. One is called gonadarchy, and the other one is adrenarchy. And they can be, they're linked with each other, but they can also have disconnect be with, between each other. And I'm not going to cover the pathology of puberty today. I'm not going to talk about precocious puberty or delayed puberty. I'm going to talk about normal physiological process. So puberty really is gonna dark. It starts with gonna dark. It's activation of our sexual uh, uh, gonads, the organs that produce the uh, uh, gonads by pituitary hormones. So coming all the way, and I'll show you the picture in a minute. Through the follicle stimulating hormone, very important hormone for our uh, endocrine function as humans in a, a, a gender sexual way, and luteinizing hormone LH. And then this, in a, in a normal physiological cascade, triggers adrenarche, which is increased production of androgens. And I challenge anyone in the audience to read the name of that hormone. DHEA, I won't, but that's how we call it, DHEA, and androsterenoidine uh, by the adrenal cortex. And for those of you who are not in medical field, adrenal are the glands that sit on top of our kidneys that really produce life important hormones. So this is what happens with males. So LH, this luteinizing hormone, stimulates the lytic cells. So we start with the brain. The brain sends signals to the pituitary gland, which is really holy grail for our hormonal production and the body. And then pituitary gland dispatches FSH and LH down. And in a male, that's testicles. That's where the energy of the male uh, uh, hormonal system lays in. So LH stimulates the Leydig cells in the testicles to produce the testosterone. As many of you know, testosterone is a male main main hormone. Please notice there is also a little bit of estradiol on the side there being produced, which is a female cascade of hormones. But it is testosterone that is responsible to the increase uh, of the uh, testicular volume. So the first sign of puberty in boys is actually not the growth of the penis or pubic hair. It is an enlarging testicles. And testosterone induces down the line the growth of penis, deepening of the voice, growth of the hair, and increase in the muscular mass, and you can see the cells there in the testicles which start producing the sperm. In females, FSH stimulates the growth of ovarian follicles. So we have ovaries as females. FSH and LH stimulate production of estradiol, which is a main female hormone. And I'm not going into the details of progesterone regulation, and that's fine. I just want you to have a big picture. And estradiol stimulates breast development and growth of the skeleton in females. But together, FSH, LH, and estradiol lead to the ovulation, the female becomes coming of reproductive age and development of menstrual cycle. So in addition to the sex hormones, there are androgenic hormones that induce the growth and maturation of the apocrine sweat glands. These are the glands that make us produce adult odor. And those of you who have raised teenagers, you know that they go and shop for 10 deodorants at the, at the same time. And the development of the acne on the face, which is also directly related to the androgenic cascade of the hormones. Other very important hormones are also involved in this cycle 
cycle. And those induce the growth hormone, um, insulin-like uh, growth factor, thyroid access, that's why we're seeing a lot of thyroid storms around puberty, oxytocin and vasopressin, which are directly related to our capacity to retain fluid and actually have been linked to some of the mood disorders and uh, mental health disorders. And the chronic health issues such as HIV, malnutrition, prolonged stress can definitely affect that hormonal cascade and can delay the puberty. And I just want to show with you the picture with the courtesy of one of my patients that I received last year in my clinic in Washington, D.C. It's a young girl, a refugee from Ethiopia. She came to us with a weight of 17.2 kilos, and here's the weight in pounds. As you can see on her body, besides very severe malnutrition, there is really no sign of her any sexual maturation, yet this girl is a 17 years old girl who, whose malnourishment and perinatally diagnosed HIV infection with multiple comorbidity did not allow puberty to come on time as you would expect a 17 years old girl look to look like. So the, to really define how we go through these bodily changes, Marshall and Tanner in England in 1960s came up with the five stages. Five stages of our bodily changes that encompass our sexual maturation. Actually, it's a development of secondary sexual characteristics. And this was done primarily in Britain. And this was done primarily among British Caucasian populations. And it definitely needs to be adjusted for different ethnicity and race. And I'm very pleased that World Health Organization in 2010 went in and adopted it and it gave much wider ranges for each of the stages that they were in original tenor stage. So we actually kind of abandoning with time the term tenor stage we are calling it now sexual maturation stage, and it's list one. And one, like you can see, starting zero to 15, and on the left you see FEMAS, and it's download. You can all easily Google it and get it from WHO website. And on the right there are males, and you can see comparatively what's happening in the stage one being really a child body going into the stage two, breast budding development, and then enlargement of the testicles, as we mentioned primarily, and then moving on on acquiring secondary other characteristics. And then females, please remember, breast precede hair development and menstrual cycle, and the male testicular enlargement precedes any other development. And the stages four and five really are bringing you closer to being a full mature and stage five is considered to be a full maturation stage in terms of secondary sexual characteristic and sexual maturation. So what besides we mentioned already and I've given you example of environmental effect which is a disease, what other factors can affect the puberty and in fact genetics affect it much more. In fact 85% of our puberty is affected by our genetics and only about um, 15 to 25% been estimated roughly by environmental factors. This is a very important study on the left. It has been done in the United States in 1970s and in the blue line uh, uh, the uh, African-American um, uh, girls, and in the green bars are Caucasian girls. And it was the first study that showed that actual onset of puberty by ages underneath, in chronological ages, are quite different, and African-American girls start puberty earlier. That was the first time when we recognized race, ethnicity matter. And for those of us who are in clinical practice, it's not unusual to ask the mother about the time of onset of her menstrual period, because very, um, in the majority of times, young girls will follow up their mother's pattern and they will go through the development at the same age that their mothers did. Now you've heard recently a lot of conversation in recent years in the media, etc., about, oh, they are growing faster, oh, the adolescence has been accelerated. Some very fine studies in Netherlands and Northern Europe have looked at it, French studies as well, and actually there is very mild acceleration of physical maturation of the stages that I've shown you. Maybe we're talking about the matter of three, four, maximally six Six months. So it's a little bit exaggerated by media. However, we do know that there have been some movement and that even small increase brings attention and you want to try to understand why it is happening. And I just listed a couple of very interesting reasons from a diverse manuscript. One of them is in studies. One is potentially increase of the BMI. BMI is body mass index. In other words, we are getting wealthy and in particular in the developed world, the children are having heavier weights in general. And that uh, heavier weight 
comes with a fat. And the aromatization of adrenal androgens, which is another hormone from the cascade that I've shown you, the also very interesting hormone leptin as a result of that can accelerate the puberty. So there is some consideration and hypothesis that's what could do it. Another exposures that we know could accelerate puberty is social family stress. And some very interesting studies have shown that the presence of adult non-biologically related male and household can accelerate puberty in the young females in a household. So again, some environmental factors. So what happens during the, what to watch out, what could be accompanying symptoms besides the symptoms described and the, the normal characteristic. And I just listed a few to which attention needs to be paid both by caregivers, by those who come across adolescents through this time of transformation of their bodies, by families. The uh, boys can present with a urethral discharge they can present with scrotal masses, and this is a time to identify varicose cell or hydrocella that might not have been seen before. There is inguinal adenopathy, it's lymph nodes in inguinal area. Inguinal hernia is a time really of the life to identify it. And if the boy is uncircumcised, then circumcised hygiene really needs to be addressed, and, and, and circumcision needs to be addressed in African region for sure. Female genital uh, system can present with vulvar itching, some discharge, dysmenorrhea, usually it takes up to two years to normalize your cycle to become more regular. So the first two years you can expect all kind of menstrual dysfunctions. STDs uh, are applicable both to females and males, but for females especially because the onset of sexual activity puts females at a high risk biologically for acquiring STIs than males. Contraception and finally new female hygiene, some aspects of hygiene that have not been there before. And for breast development, tenderness erythema, um, you can have lymphatic nodes in the axilla, and also wanted to point out to you that males, because remember there was that little arrow of some estradiol being produced along the cascade of male sex or maturation, they can present with gynecomastia that's swollen red and enlarged uh, um, uh, breast tissue during the part of the normal sexual maturation growth. So how does it all affect the growth curves? Well, actually, it's very interesting to see that the girls on your left, they actually start their growth spur earlier than the boys. So girls start getting taller, younger than the boys. And you guys have seen it in your schools when you grow up, right? So the boys are so embarrassed in seventh, eighth grade. They're standing at the end of the line while the girls are all standing in front. It's going to change because the boys are going to catch up and they actually continue growth spurt later than the girls. And they actually gain through the growth spurt approximately one and a half to two centimeters more in the height. And overall, we gain up to 25% of adult height during this period of time, usually around 20, but we gain up to 50% of adult weight. And the muscle growth is a dominant force for the growth physically in boys and the fat tissue in girls, and I'll talk in a minute about that. The growth starts from periphery. The growth starts from the limbs. Those of us who raised young children know what happens. They start changing shoe sizes in one summer, three shoe sizes, and you are going to the shop each time looking at your credit card. But at the same time, that growth from periphery moves centrally, and then the, that's what matters. What matters in the growth spurt is the truncal height, your spinal height. That's what matters. Peak female growth velocity always prepares approximately about half a year before the start of the menstrual cycle, menarche. And it's usually overall the growth spurt lasts about two years. And there are some more seasonal variations. There have been reports that the children and adolescents grow more in the spring overall. And that's been sustained by some studies. So in a very elegant paper by Pat Patton from Great Britain from 2000, and seven, that's how it's pretty much listed. You can see the breast stages on the top, you are looking at the uh, females, on the bottom, you are looking at the males, and you can see at the bottom peak velocity in the pink box, you can see that in females it happens earlier and it happens later in males. So how about body mass? Um, uh, males acquire the majority of the body mass through the muscle lean body mass. So they actually lose fat in the beginning of puberty. Girls opposite, they acquire fat just because of sheer mere breast development. And throughout all puberty, they acquire primarily fat. So girls add some lean body mass, but they grow in body mass 
and you can see it on the left, is more subtle and it's higher in terms of that, and the boys is more abrupt as the growth spurt as well uh, it is. And in females, unfortunately, body fat reminds our problem way beyond <coughs> adolescence. So for the body system, skin, what to look for? Acne, fascial, axillary, hair development in the black people in grown hair is a real issue, particularly when the young men start shaving. The adolescence is a very frequent age of onset of myopia or nearsightedness because of the axis of the eye growing very fast, too fast, and there is a disconnect between the growth of the eye bulb with overall growth spurt. So your body grows faster than your eye, and your axis doesn't catch with your overall uh, growth. Dentition, please remember, they're still erupting the third set of the molar teeth, those ones in the back there. Uh, because of the loss of the fat tissue, particularly in a young male, this is the age where a lot of heart murmurs get diagnosed. In reality, these are functional murmurs that have been there all life. It's just because of the loss of the body fat mass that you start hearing them. From the point of view of hematology, a lot of anemia issues in adolescents need to be addressed, particularly in young females, particularly during the time of start of menstrual periods because they frequently lose a lot of blood, and iron deficiency and dietary uh, supplementation needs to be considered. And finally, musculoskeletal is scoliosis, joint issues and scoliosis for non-medical field is a curving of your spine because your spine grows so fast. There is a very interesting condition really attributed only to adolescents described by Osgood Slaughter and therefore named in his honor. That's an inflammation right on your knee, right below your patella, which is very characteristic of the adolescent age. It's a benign inflammation, but it can really affect your sport performance and daily quality of life. And finally, a lot of sport and accidental injury. This is the age when they do it, in particular, during the injuries, we are concerned with the damage to the long bones, epiphyseal growth plates that are located at the end of each of your long bones because that can stop the development and growth of that particular long bone. And in fact, bone health really matters in adolescence. Bone grows in length first, but it also gets wider. It also gets more mineralized. It requires more bone density. 50% of total body calcium is accumulated during puberty in females and more so in males. And in fact, by the end of the puberty, males have 50% more of total body calcium in their bones than females. And it is more prominent in African-American females that have been shown in the States than Caucasian girls. But what's most importantly, we are starting having more and more signals that any kind of insult uh, to the bone during this age or any kind of deficiency in bone calcium deposition in adolescence can have actually effect on the early onset of osteoporosis. So not only direct relation with a fracture risk at this age, but also quite down the line. Another area which I will not talk about because I will, it's my favorite topic and I could stay on it quite a long time, but I will just touch on that we know very little about the potential changes in the body composition on the drug metabolism. And there is a fantastic paper by Greg Kearns that the major review on developmental pharmacology where he cites a Japanese study that looked at the clearance of the body, uh, the capacity to clear through the cytochrome P452C99 system of warfarin, which is an um, anticoagulant agent. And what you can see, they have children in a light blue and a darker blue uh, pubertal, prepubertal, pu pubertal, and adults. And you can see they were very interesting, uh, very subtle, but still changes in, in the differences in how the drug was eliminated by the body. And they adjusted it by age and body mass, which is very important for pharmacokinetic evaluation, but they didn't adjust it for the size of the liver. It's just estimated, not real size of the liver. So there is a caveat to the this data, but nevertheless, it raises an issue. Do we know everything about how going through this bodily physical changes changes your pharmacokinetic drug compartments? And I would say we don't. And finally, during the adolescence, we have an onset of a lot of health conditions significantly more than we see that in pediatrics and adult life. So polycystic ovarian syndrome is frequently onset during the adolescence. Many eating disorders, and I'm not stopping on any mental health issues, but just highlighting this is a becoming more and more an issue for us today. Depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues in adolescence seem to be on the rise. 
adulthood asthma. If the child had asthma and he carries it on through the adulthood, or if he has a new onset of asthma in, ad in adolescence, he is much more likely to have asthma throughout his adult years. The onset of epilepsy is very frequently seen also in adolescent life. And then diabetes type 1 in fact, uh, is frequently onset precisely in adolescence. Equally, a lot of autoimmune diseases such as lupus, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and thyroiditis are starting in adolescence, and we really do not know why they are starting in this specific age, why they are not starting at the early age, and why they are not waiting until the body is more adult. And finally, early onset of puberty has been associated with a shorter eventual total height and increased body mass index. And also certain diseases have been associated, even infectious and etiology, needless to say HIV, I'm not going even to mention that, with adolescence with a higher incidence. But even the disease like malaria, and it's a study from Uganda that reported in a red line significant surge in morbidity in the incidence of malaria based on the age in those younger than 20. Though in the red line, you can see the use of the protective nets, and you can see, I'm sorry, opposite, right? The, the green line, protective nets. And you can see that the protective nets are used much less in a young age. So it seems to be risk behavior related rather than do. But for schistosomiasis, for example, it's a very similar data. So again, there might be some increased susceptibility to certain diseases in a younger age. And finally, in recent years, we start seeing a very important and a very concerning signs of the effect of what happens to us in puberty many, many years after. And this is a really milestone study published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2016 that followed a very large cohort of adolescents in Israel for 44 years. And what they have shown in there that if the during the adolescence the person had a body mass index between 50 to 74 percentile, and this is within an accepted range, this is not exceeding so relatively cold normal ranges just in the higher end of the normal range. They had significantly increased cardiovascular and all-cause mortality 40 years later and during the whole years of 40 follow-up. And the overweight and obesity were strongly associated with increased mortality into adulthood. So something that happens to us during this age truly matters as many years as 40 years after. And that field of the linkage between adolescent health and the older age is just start emerging. So this is a really nice that we're moving into direction and looking into that. And finally, as I come to the last few slides, I want to touch on, on the causes of mortality and tell you how the shift was age. In the red, you see age 10 to 14, and in the black, 15 to 19 years old. In the both part, you see females, and lower, you see males. And you can see how it shifts. They are very similar in the 10, uh, in the 10 to 14 years of age. There's no much difference, but there is a very significant difference that happens after you become in your second stage of adolescence. And road injury being number one in males, followed by interpersonal violence and self-harm drowning. And then in females, I really want to highlight something we heard in a previous talk, tremendous maternity-related conditions being very tremendous contributor to the mortality. Please do not forget, 16 million births a year happen to the girls 15 to 19 years of age, and 1 million happens to the girls younger than 15 years of age. And that continues to be our major problem to tackle on the global arena. And finally, you know, that, that, that maturation and all we've discussed with you is really is evolving over time. And there is a very interesting theory that we are spreading and becoming more torn between the biological maturation and psychosocial maturation. In many years before, when girls were marrying at 13, when they had to go to the field to collect harvest with their parents starting age of eight, the assumption of 
adult responsibility, when pregnancy was a real risk from every sexual encounter, the assumption of adult responsibilities and integration in adult lifestyle was much, uh, uh, much earlier. And now we are protecting them, we're sending them to study, they have a, a contraception. Uh, everything has changed and therefore that gap is growing between biological maturation and yet prolonged full social integration in becoming fully inverted adult and how it's going to affect our capacity and future of the society really remains to be answered. And many questions we still don't know. We don't know why and how puberty starts. We know it starts, right? But we don't know why we start producing pulsatile in our hypothalamus dyshormones. And the answer to this question could give us a clue to many, many key to many, many health conditions if we could find this answer. We don't know the relationship between puberty and the cascade I showed and central nervous system development. We don't know fine central nervous system marking, markers relationship to this hormonal cascade. We don't know also relationship between puberty and many health issues that I cited, why this disease is having onset at this age. We don't know the triggers of diseases with onset during adolescence. We don't know the long-term complications. And finally, in the West, as you know, the gender um, identity is totally evolved. We're now looking completely differently at it. And we don't know what puberty does. We opened in our hospital in Washington the first LGBT clinic for children. And we're treating 13 years old children with hormones stopping their puberty if they decided to change their gender. But the reality is we don't know what we are doing to their bodies on the long run and we really need to understand it better. And finally, as I showed you, we really don't know and need to start modeling the impact of the gross mismatch between biological and social maturity down the line. And as we bring it to what should we do, many of you come from the programmatic area. We are here to discuss not science. We are here, not only science, but we are here to discuss how to turn the wheel around is what can we take out of these lessons and that knowledge that I just shared with you and how should we apply it to real world. And, and it comes to me to just few bullets that I wanted to highlight at the end of my talk is we need to have comprehensive, multidisciplinary health care, including for journal medicine, high quality medicine for adolescents and specialized care in high risk areas. We need to educate adolescents in health and health care services and encourage healthcare seeking behaviors, including independent health care and access. And we need to educate and support parents and caregivers and those in communities who work with adolescents because they come across it and then they're as confused as adolescents are and as at loss as how to deal with them as they are. And finally, the second decade continues as I wrap my talk and see it to the next talk. I'm very happy I don't have to discuss that topic. <laughs>